All right. This is another lesion from the foot, a mass on the plantar foot, slowly growing over a few years and it is kind of painful, so they took it out. When we go in here, let's look at the pink stuff first. Look at this. This is dense, regular connective tissue. Very, very dense pink collagen, bland little fibroblasts in between, and look at those waves there. Very wavy. Too wavy to be nerve. If you've watched any of my videos or heard me talk before online, you know I love to talk about that if it's ultra wavy, it's usually not nerve. Very, very wavy like this that looks almost like ramen noodles or instant noodles when they come out of the package dry. Oh, I see. Yes, uh, Dr. Olga Lenskaya just put in the chat ramen. You are totally right. This is the ramen noodle sign, which tells you something is dense regular connective tissue, tendon, tendon sheath, fascia, ligament, any of those. Or in the setting of a neoplasm that has this kind of pattern, you could think of neural, but what I think of first is actually fibroblastic differentiation because fibroblastic lesions tend to have similarities to this and they kind of shrink up and it looks like ramen noodles, okay? Or like an accordion, if you like, uh, whatever, whatever works for you. But I like the ramen noodle sign in honor of my former fellow, Dr. Ed Fulton, who came up with that and I thought it was brilliant. So why is it important to focus? I, I always like to teach this normal histology stuff because sometimes that tells you a lot about not maybe the surgeon gave you the anatomic site, but this can tell you a lot about how deep you are, where exactly you are. We know here we are down deep, right? We are down at the tendon sheath level or, or deeper, okay? And coming off of this, we have a kind of cellular, kind of blue tumor. It's arranged in kind of multiple nodules here. And when we go closer, where's the area I wanted to show you? The spindle cells, even though they're a little hyperchromatic, I think part of that in this case was uh, we were having a little bit of uh, trouble with the H&E and it was staining things a little darker. So I know the nuclei do look a bit darker here. But uh, aside from that, the cells are kind of mon monotonous and uniform. And look at how they run in the biggest fascicle you can imagine. Like they're all running the same direction in parallel, right? If this were like a highway or a, or a big uh, you know, road with cars on it, it would be like 100 lanes wide, right? It'd be like the biggest, widest road in the world, all right? So that very broad sweeping fascicles of bland spindle cells um, and the fact that the spindle cells, look, a few of them touch each other, but most of them are not touching each other. They're divided by pink bundles of fine, delicate collagen in between. So those features together is characteristic of fibromatosis, okay? In the deep soft tissue, when you see this pattern, you think of desmoid fibromatosis. In the hands and feet, you think of palmo, palmar or plantar fibromatosis, which has similar features, but is a lot smaller, is, is not as problematic um, as desmoid fibromatosis from a symptom perspective. And it seems to be driven by a different process um, than um, desmoid fibromatosis, but they have a microscopically lots of similarities. So once you know what desmoid tumor looks like, you can kind of apply those same principles to looking at uh, these, okay? So uh, here's another area where you can see the broad sweeping fascicles. And here's more over here. Look at that, like the entire screen, all of the fibroblasts are running the same direction. And I say fibroblasts, but actually a lot of times these will have some actin expression. So fibroblasts and myofibroblasts, I don't know the, the molecular biology, but I'll tell you that from a morphology perspective and an immunostain perspective, fibroblasts and myofibroblasts tend to exist on a spectrum. And many lesions that we call fibroblastic will have some actin staining. So I kind of lump myofibroblast and fibroblast together for practical purposes in diagnostic soft tissue pathology, okay? So um, the reason I wanted to show this case is because this is a pretty big and cellular example of fibromatosis. There are some mitoses. Here's one right here. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the cellularity and the mitotic activity and the size of the lesion might make you concerned that this is something bad. You might even think this is like a synovial sarcoma or something. Synovial sarcomas sometimes can have areas that are like this, but usually synovial sarcoma, the cells are very closely packed together in, in some areas of the tumor at least. I have seen ones that had hypocellular areas, but usually you can find an area where the fascicles are very densely packed and the cells are crushed right up against each other, okay? So the, um, the separation of the cells by collagen in between, the way they're all running together in these very, very broad fascicles in the same direction, all of that's helpful. Look how wavy they get. Again, I told you the, the fibroblastic tumors 
gross, similar to dense regular connective tissue, and they tend to get wavy like this um, as an artifact of processing, actually. So the other thing to bring up is this. You look at areas like this, that doesn't look like fascicles of spindle cells. That looks like a bunch of round cells. Again, though, they're round cells, but they're not in a sheet like a round blue cell malignant neoplasm. They're each divided by collagen. And what we're seeing here is just a trick. This is the same as those fascicle areas, but it's cut 90 degrees. This is what happens if you cut straight across a fascicle. In cross-section, spindle cells will look round when you're looking at them on end, right? So that's an important thing. Like if you look at a carrot, long ways, it's going to be elongated. Cut it in half, it's a round circle, right? And I know that's common sense, but it can sometimes be very disconcerting it particularly I find in um, this setting of fibromatosis in the foot because the fascicles are so large that when you get a whole fascicle cut across, it's so many round cells that sometimes if you see this area first, you're not gonna think about fibromatosis at all. It looks like a round cell thing. So, so look around at all the areas and then if you start finding the nice fascicles, then you'll know, oh, those round cells are just, they're cut straight across here, okay? Instead of long ways. So that's a trick that I think confuses a lot of people. Fibromatosis in the palm, also known as Dupuytren's contracture, has the same features as this, but it's usually very small and very subtle and low on cellularity. Sometimes I get removal for a Dupuytren's contracture and I don't find any fibromatosis at all. It's just kind of fibrotic tendon and I don't see any parallel fascicles of spindle cells. But when you do find them, I find I, usually they are very, very small in the palm. On the foot, the opposite is true. The foot fibromatoses are usually big. They're usually more cellular, kind of more hyperchromatic, I feel like, and they're usually more mitotically active. I don't know. I have wondered over the years if this is because people let them grow longer on the foot, because, you know, if, if something is on your hand, palmar fibromatosis usually causes a trigger finger, which is obviously annoying and problematic for your daily life. Uh, on the bottom of your foot, unless it's really painful or uncomfortable, you know, your foot still works, so you can tolerate it until it gets to the point that it's really annoying. Plus, I've had surgery on the bottom of my foot to have a nevus removed, and it was really uncomfortable, and it got infected, and I was on crutches for a month. So having a, um, something removed from the bottom of your foot is not um, always a, a walk in the park, okay? It can be really annoying and problematic. Um, so in any case, um, that is, uh, it's important, and I feel like over the years, I've seen people get really concerned um, about the plantar foot fibromatosis, which is also known as Lederhose's disease if you're into uh, old school eponyms. So just know that, that it's okay to have increased cellularity. You're going to see some areas that look round cell depending on the cut. You can have mitosis. Somehow this myth evolved over time that fibromatosis should not have mitosis. I would say almost every case of like desmoid fibromatosis I see has occasional mitosis. I mean, it has to grow somehow, right? But uh, people get very uh, worked up and worried about that. I've seen many cases um, um, where people have sent in, in consult and said, well, I think it's fibromatosis, but there's mitosis present and that's okay. So someone asked, um, uh, is, should this be confirmed by IHC? Well, you certainly can. I would say that, so as you all probably know, fibromatosis, desmoid fibromatosis is classically known to have nuclear expression of beta catenin. Okay. And I have a whole video on my YouTube channel, all about desmoid fibromatosis that shows multiple cases, if you'd like. The problem with beta catenin is it's kind of a difficult stain to work with because it stains the cytoplasm of like everything. And cytoplasmic staining is totally nonspecific, doesn't mean anything. So what we need is to see nuclear staining, but in a thin spindle cell without much cytoplasm, when the cytoplasm picks up the stain, sometimes it makes it very difficult to see if the nuclei are truly staining or not. Also, in my experience, when you do get nuclear staining, it tends to not be 100% of the cells. It's like a subset of the cells that have visible nuclear beta catenin, and um, in, that's in desmoid fibromatosis. In palmar and plantar fibromatosis, they are usually going to be nuclear beta catenin positive also, although the molecular reason is different. In, in uh, desmoid fibromatosis, usually it's because of either the person has an underlying APC gene um, abnormality that's germline, or because they have an activating mutation in the beta catenin gene. And at least the last time I read about palmar and plantar, they do not have those molecular problems, although they do still have an increased expression of beta catenin. So beta catenin is, is activated some, uh, through some other method I'm not sure if people have pieced that out yet. Maybe, I mean, there's been a lot of new literature that I've not read on this topic, so perhaps. Um, but in any case, uh, you could do beta catenin, but I find that if you can't get to the diagnosis on H&E, beta catenin often will 
confuse you more than it helps you. Now, not always. I've had times where it really helped out a lot on a small biopsy, but I've seen times where it's made people want to call things, including myself, want to call things fibromatosis, that it was actually just scar tissue, um, or times where something looked good for fibromatosis, and then one of my residents ordered beta catena, and it was negative. And I thought, well, now what do I do? I think in that case, I just called it fibromatosis anyway, because it was classic on H&E. But the problem is, is that I think beta catena is difficult to use, but you can try it if you have it in your lab. More important here, I think it would be totally fine if you wanted to do like a keratin or a TLE1, something to exclude the possibility of, of a subtle synovial sarcoma. That's totally fine because you can have subtle, small synovial sarcomas on the hands and feet. Um, that can be very small, even like less than a centimeter. That's well described in the literature. Um, and those tend to have a pretty good prognosis. But um, in a case like this, I've occasionally done some immunostains to make sure I wasn't missing a synovial sarcoma when it got really revved up. Maybe I did even on this case. I can't remember. This was from a long time ago. All right. So this is, uh, we, we have talked about it to death, but I think it's important because these are relatively common entities and they really can trick you because of the, the reasons we, we described. All right. But I think in general, um, you can usually diagnose them on H&E. And again, a little bit of that ramen noodle effect right here. See, it's wavy, not neural though, okay? Not neural. All right, so that's a plantar fibromatosis 